Hello, and um, welcome to um, another technical talk at the Friendly Nestle Cafe. Uh, my name is Dr. Jonathan Pelham. I'm very grateful to the, uh, the Bedford branch of the Royal Animal Society for partnering with us so that uh, we can make this a hybrid talk so that uh, we can both be spatially separated here in comfort with our drinks, but also that those who are not able to attend uh, in person are able to also uh, hear what's going on. Uh, so this talks about Python for Aerospace, Python the programming language. Uh, after the talk, I'm going to circulate some uh, material if you want to follow on, along at home. And uh, the important thing that uh, you, you need to consider is you just need to configure an environment uh, from a specification. Uh, this is one of the, the primary things you run into in scientific computing and in computing in general is, is your environment configured correctly? And because of, I'm using the Anaconda uh, distribution, that's actually very straightforward. So there'll be a link to the Anaconda uh, documentation where you can get that. Uh, but uh, an environment uh, specification would be provided, and you just have to uh, do the command here, conda, n create dash f, f dash f is turned to do it from file, and environment.yaml is just the name of the file. Uh, it could be anything, it's whatever the name of the file is. Uh, but um, that's one of the things, when we want to do things in aerospace, we want to make sure we've got the right environment to get them done. Uh, we could be talking about safety culture, we could be talking about safety management system, we talk about a culture of accountability, about uh, a cultural training, but making sure our environment is right is one of the key things we need to have in order to make things, sure things are successful. So uh, we're going to be uh, talking a little bit about why Python, uh, some, some basics on uh, how Python works, uh, some talk about calculations and optimization, uh, briefly touching on multi domain optimization, uh, we, uh, quick look at how you can do some aerodynamics. Uh, some flight data analysis, and then uh, finishing on some talk about containers and why that's interesting from our perspective of engineering. Uh, so there's uh, uh, a slightly old safety graphic from the uh, Aviation Safety Network about uh, airline statistics uh, for fatal accidents. And you can see they're blessedly rare uh, in the only uh, 20, 20 fatal accidents in 2019, but there's still too much. So we want to learn from uh, the accidents we do have and the, the near accidents, the incidents, so that we can improve on our safety. And in uh, the, the current cult cultural context, we've also got uh, general aviation, drones and helicopters that are all pressing towards this new, exciting, zeitgeist thing, which is UAM, Urban Air Mobility, or Urban E-VTOL, electric urban vehicles. And if we're going to make that happen and be safe, then we need to learn all the lessons from helicopters, which will do uh, a very similar mission to EV tolls, where they're doing lots of vertical lift uh, in and around urban environments. Drones, which uh, they're using electric systems and uh, autonomous navigation, things like that. But also the lessons from general aviation, where uh, the safety record is perhaps not as good as could be wanted uh, when things are in general um, population. So we need to learn from all of these uh, factors. General aviation, especially because they're often used in unregulated airspace. Um, and so that is also what we have with urban uh, detail. So the main thing here is in our environment, in our safety environment, we want to learn from some data. And so here, I think Python is one of the key tools to, to do that. So, but why Python? If you're going to do some kind of large scale analysis, you're going to have to use some kind of computer to do it. And computers, they don't speak the English very well. Uh, there's a lot of uh, progress we made in natural language processing, which is a a kind of a system to help comp uh, computers to understand what English means, the semantic meaning. There's great things we were chatting to earlier just today about so things like the Grove uh, data set from Stanford uh, and about um, uh, efforts being made by uh, such small little companies like Microsoft to do it, but it's still not a solved problem. Uh, Python actually has a very good library for that, I should mention, called NLTK, Natural Language Toolkit. But uh, when selecting a way to do it, there's lots of different languages. Uh, back in the day when I, when I did my undergraduate, I was taught Java as the appropriate language that all aerospace engineers needed to know. Um, and it was because it's supposed to be a human readable language, it's supposed to be easy to, to apply to lots of different machines. If you wanted things to be faster, you might have a look at C, C++, um, which uh, nowadays, if you look at type safety, uh, would perhaps be disregarded uh, because there are lots of places where you can run out of memory. In fact, most of the, um, the big hacks things like cryptocurrencies, is actually memory buffer overruns, uh, where someone didn't handle pointers correctly in C, and there was uh, some item where the hacker was able to ask the pointer to return a, a location in memory that uh, 
was actually belonging to a different process and therefore gets crucial information. Fast and it's relatively human readable is uh, not ideal for this kind of application. It also has to be compiled. Uh, Fortran, blazing fast, still used in a lot of banks because it is so fast at doing maths. But it's a little bit creaky if you want to do anything object orientated. Uh, but it's much closer to what the machine will actually want. Uh, so it does work fast. There's assembler, even faster than Fortran, and machine code faster than that. But these things get progressively harder for humans to write and maintain on a regular basis. And then you've got things that are parallel. If you want to have lots of different processes running at the same time, there's not a massive amount of choices there. Mostly because of how difficult a problem that is. But there are evolving frameworks like Spark, which is uh, based on Scala, which is a, a close cousin of Java. Uh, but then uh, there's two really good ones in the middle, which are Rust and Go. Rust came out of Mozilla, uh, and its whole thing is and it's, it's going to be really fast. It looks like Python, so it's easy to write and read, but it's got a lot of memory safe features, so it's, it's much more easy to write uh, robust, repeatable code. Uh, there's even some talk about that being the future for things like uh, Linux and autopilots and other flight systems uh, replace it, possibly uh, having a role uh, where ADA is, uh, is a, a, a safety critical language. It's perhaps not as appropriate. Maybe Rust is the near term replacement for C, C++. Go is um, a language that came out of Google for a very similar application where they wanted to parallelize a lot of applications uh, and they wanted to do it as safely as possible and also as human readable as possible. Which brings us back to Python being a very human readable way. Because one of the, the critical time limitations in anyone's code when you're writing something to deal with a problem that you have is your ability to understand the problem and to translate it into something the computer can understand. And that's why I've, I arrived at using Python, because it, it's reasonably quick for me to write something with it to do something useful. And then if something needs to go faster, there are libraries that can be applied. There's uh, ways and means you can make Python go faster. And at the end of the day, once you've got something working in Python, you can always make something work in a fast language if absolutely necessary. But as a scientist looking at problems, Python is fast enough for most of my applications. But those are the, the critical things that you've got things that are fast for humans to understand, fast for machines to understand, or, or fast in terms of being able to paralyze them out of thousands of different machines. And this, these, are, I think, are, is our intersection. And for me, Python is a, is a winner here uh, because uh, my time is more valuable than machines, quite frankly. We can buy more machines, I can't buy more me. Um, this is uh, what we also talk about here, where I'm talking about uh, you can either scale vertically your code or you can scale horizontally. Horizontally, you just buy more computers. I would love the budget code for that. Uh, vertically, you just, just buy better computers. I think all of us would like to do that as well. Or we, could, uh, we can laugh at the idea that we're going to write more efficient code. Uh, maybe we will next time. But uh, for now, while we want to address our problems, we're just, just going to look at Python. Uh, so Python, what is it? It's, um, it's often referred to as a glue code because it's, it can be used to connect a lot of different programs to a lot of different other programs, which is a very useful thing when in engineering, we often have a, little, a lot of little short programs that do one thing in analysis and we want to connect the output of that to something else. Uh, historically, you might have used bash scripts for this or, pi or pipes in, in Linux, but uh, that's kind of fallen by the wayside. Um, so the Python has a very good documentation. Coming from MATLAB, I can say it's actually better than MATLAB's documentation. Um, within this, which is a, a Jupyter notebook, we can also do things like Markdown and LaTeX, so you can have very nice, pretty maths to look at. And uh, as someone who did lots of maths in my PhD, I can say that I, I value the ability to, to typeset in my code pretty maths, because uh, it's much easier for me to understand <laughs> if I can read it properly. Uh, there's also uh, NumPy, which uh, there'll be links to this in uh, distributed afterwards. But NumPy is a library that uh, someone looked at Python uh, back in the day, because I think Python is almost uh, 30 years old now, if my memory doesn't fail me. And they said, I like this language, but it's not enough like MATLAB. And so they wrote a library in, in C for Python to give Python a way to do MATLAB style matrices and uh, matrix uh, manipulation. So. If you're using a lot of MATLAB, NumPy is your immediate first place to go. Uh, coupled with SciPy, which is another library intended for scientific computation. So that's where we've got our fast Fourier transforms. That's where we've got uh, packs to do signal analysis, linear algebra. Uh, that's where we've got things where we can do harmonic analysis. There's a massive amount of stuff in there. And then MATPOTLIB. I'm going to be showing you some examples from, uh, from these libraries uh, today. 
Uh, so there's also some local applications that are worth uh, looking at. There's uh, OpenMDAO, that's so a multi domain uh, optimization system which is written in Python. Uh, 3K, which is a, a, um, a community design package that's mostly written in Python and has a Python API. So you can do a lot of what's called parametric design, uh, where you, you're working in things like uh, stress optimization, uh, you're working in uh, parameters into your, the the dimensions of your parts. So that if we change another part in your system of parts, the parameters on the connected parts will all be updated automatically. And if you wanted to uh, do a system of experiments where you're looking at uh, different combinations of uh, parts or within a structure, within an assembly, and you wanted to quickly iterate through lots of different designs, but you didn't want to have to change the, the CAD uh, underlying, because uh, if you wanted to put things through finite element analysis, you have to put your constraints, you have to put the, 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 the mesh and then you have to execute with whatever loads you have. But if you've got parent uh, code and you, with something like free code where you've got, you can interact with it and you can write your Python uh, on top of it, you can automatically iterate through lots of different combinations of geometries and the applicable uh, stress conditions. Uh, so you can just do it running as a batch, which is much more uh, efficient with the time of engineers, which is often uh, the thing that is actually the most costly. Even if we're buying expensive computers and expensive graphics cards to be able to run these things, the engineer's time is almost always going to be the most expensive part of that process and the part that takes the longest. So where we can optimize that time, we can do things a bit better. Uh, Blender, which is a graphic processing software, is also a very good example because uh, Python has an API in there as well, and it's been used for a number of very noticeable animations of things like start, spaceship flights, uh, re-entries, where people are trying to communicate what is actually going to happen to other people? Uh, because although we have all these fancy tools and uh, I, I love playing with Python and writing maths, I'm not so great about writing reports, but the primary aspect of engineering is that we have to communicate what, what we think is the best solution to somebody else. So having ways to do that and having uh, systems and languages that can effectively do that is critical for engineering. Uh, I also mentioned three blue, one brown. Uh, if uh, there are those who are like YouTube uh, talks about maths, there's a channel there and they have some very fancy animations showing you how uh, matrix algebra and uh, things like that actually works. And that's all done in Python. So it's just worth mentioning. Uh, there's um, also a lot of uh, modern CAD packages have Python plugins so you can write Python to interact directly with them. So uh, some of the big ones like Rhino, Fusion 360, Abacus, uh, Katia and SolidWorks uh, have Visual Basic for Applications APIs, which both have very comprehensive wrappers and um, communities around using those wrappers in Python. So where you have a lot of CAD, you can still interact with it through Python. So we'll quickly uh, just talk about some of the basics of what Python really is. Uh, so in Python, everything is an object. So it's not like in, in C where you're actually uh, interacting with memory directly. You interact with objects and Python will handle uh, the background of that object and how it's represented in memory for you. So yeah, I, you thought this was, this was PowerPoint. It's, this is an odd looking PowerPoint, but actually this is a Jupyter notebook, which means I can, I can actually execute stuff in here and uh, change it and get different results. So we can add some numbers together. We can evaluate that we can get some results. And this is a, a Python um, instance, which has been configured already with the environment uh, that I mentioned before, which I'll distribute later. Uh, Python is often referred to as one of the REPL families of languages. That is that it has a read, evaluate, print loop because you can keep, you can read the response, you evaluate what it means, you can you can print out, and you can just keep moving over and iterating until you can make it uh, do what you want. So perhaps actually, I, I didn't intend that I added four uh, four to six. I actually wanted to uh, take six away from four, and I can keep uh, changing uh, the results of my code and quickly evaluating what's happening uh, until I get the correct result. Uh, why this is important is because if you're quickly iterating on ideas, if you're trying to improve something, you don't want to keep compiling things and then testing it. You want to test it as quickly as possible. Uh, this is one of the things that makes Python more efficient for engineers to experiment with, with ideas. Uh, there's some excellent resources if you want to get involved uh, on the Software Carpenter website. I'm actually an instructor with them, so I, I definitely highly recommend you look at that. That's all free resources. So if you uh, wanted to have a first point of where to look at stuff, Look at software company. Uh, there's also a lot of built-in functions uh, like range, 
where you can do things like uh, rain going over rain. So if you want to, uh, rain is what's called an iterator in that if every time uh, Python will go to that function, it will yield the next in whatever uh, is within it. And range is just going to iterate over zero to four when you specify five, but if you do seven, it will just give you uh, zero to six. Uh, Python has lists, it's all objects. We'll just skip to it. You've got tuples. You've got strings as a, as a primary uh, attribute. Uh, but then all of those things can be iterated over, which is a, a very powerful thing when you've got uh, lots of different types of, uh, of data. So when you've got a list, we well, obviously you can iterate over a list, you can loop over it, but you can also loop over strings, you can loop over the uh, items in a tuple, you can uh, loop over the attributes in a dictionary. So we just uh, create those and then we can see what's in them. We can uh, access those uh, using accessor methods. Uh, so we can access the list uh, via uh, the index of items within the list we might want to look at, but we can also access the string in exactly the same way. And we can uh, change uh, the values stored within the list by uh, assigning back to them, but we can't do the same thing with the string. Uh, it has to be modified differently. Uh, Python functions. Uh, and created uh, by using this uh, definition. So you go def, name of the function, and then uh, the, um, the the argument, and then the optional argument, if you have an optional argument. And then you have a doc string, which is a very important thing. Uh, by including it, it just helps uh, you to understand really what's going on, and then you can just return to value. This is a very simple function, uh, but I mention it because it just shows you can have these uh, optional arguments, which can be very useful when you're doing scientific calculation. You've got a lot of things like gravity, which in almost every case, gravity is going to be the same. But if you're going to be very, very specific, gravity is actually different everywhere on Earth, guaranteed. It's just normally by such a small amount, it doesn't matter. But perhaps uh, that does matter to your application because of the, the amount of accuracy you acquire, or perhaps you're doing something that is going to go to the moon or going to go to Mars, and you want to have your function able to take account of that. So having optional arguments could be very, very useful. Uh, but one of the, the wonderful things about Python being a, an object-based language is that uh, even though we've only written this thing a couple of moments ago, if I call help on it, it will tell us what it does and give us that doc string. And it will tell us any uh, methods surrounding it. So it really has a main method. Uh, but um, if this was a class, that help would tell us all the methods associated with that class all the class instances, all the variables. So it can be very uh, helpful when you're trying to interact with the code uh, that uh, is in other libraries that you're using, you've got these helpful methods to help you understand what it's actually doing. That was actually one of the things that drove me mad in MATLAB in that uh, if you get down to the really fast stuff that's been compiled into C that MATLAB has, you'll get to a point where it will tell you a little bit about what it does, but not how it does it. Python, you can get all the way down to how it's doing it, which is very useful when you're trying to do quite deep uh, simulations. So this is the first of our, our aerospace things. So this um, takes an uh, example from a, a very good book by a guy named Daniel Raymer on conceptual aircraft design. So this was for an anti-submarine warfare aircraft. Uh, what they wanted to do is they had some mission. They wanted to be able to fly 1,500 nautical miles at Mach uh, 0.6, carrying a certain amount of payload uh, and with four crew members, most on station for a certain amount of time return. And um, one of the things about aircraft is you kind of really have to be able to estimate what it's going to cost. And there's a very strong relationship between the weight of the aircraft and the cost of the aircraft. So we're obsessed um, with, with weight and cost. And in aerospace, we're especially obsessed with weight because uh, if the aircraft's too heavy, it's not going to take off. So we've got this, uh, this lovely looking mass uh, where we've got uh, some uh, variables like the takeoff gross weight. That's the total amount of weight the aircraft will have when it takes off with all of its fuel, all things like that. We've got the weight of the crew, the payload weight, the fuel weight, the aircraft entry weight, that's where it's not got any fuel or consumables or stores on board. And we can create an equation here uh, to, to relate all those things. Uh, so we've got relating the empty, the total gross weight to all the weight of the crew, the weight of the payload. We're defining here the, the weight of the fuel over the empty weight, because that's the, the fuel fraction, and the empty weight over the gross takeaway weight, because that, that's the empty weight fraction. So there's a bit of discussion about what these things mean and why we're looking at them. Uh, and then we're just going to import some libraries to enable us to do some additional stuff with that. 
So what we're saying here within our Jupyter Notebook is that we want any plots to be in line and we want to use the matplotlib library and the numpy library. So we can define some functions. So here, what we're doing is we're doing the takeoff gross weight. So we're saying that for some variables, so the empty weight fraction, the fuel fraction, crew weight and payload weight, we want to know what is the takeoff gross weight going to be. And so we can translate that uh, simple equation that we had into something that's uh, going to be returned here. So we can see we're adding together the crew weight and the payload weight and divided it by the uh, fuel fraction and the empty weight fraction. And you can see we can define some variables. So what the crew weight's going to be, the payload weight, fuel fraction, empty weight, and then we can print out some things to tell us that in pretty, uh, pretty strings and then just apply that calculation. So you can see that for the, the crew weights, paired weights, fuel fractions, we uh, were saying as a start, as a guess, our takeoff gross weight is going to be 61,000 pounds. Is that the right takeoff gross weight? I don't know. But this is one of the questions we're, we're expected to answer in the narrow space if we're designing a new anti submarine warfare aircraft. Uh, so this is where we start to uh, apply some, some more math and some more Python to try and make something that can help us to get close to the answer so we can start to specify things because when you do conceptual design, you have to spit out some estimates to guide the detailed design process. Like we expect that the aircraft will be of such and such a span, such and such um, uh, amount of engines of a certain specification, that it should be in no more than this amount of empty weight with certain amounts of fuel storage on board based on our search of the different parameters. This will be the optimal aircraft for the mission we've got, been asked to do. Sometimes in aviation history, you'll find people like uh, Kelly Johnson who will tell uh, people like the United States Air Force that actually the specification was wrong with his aircraft they actually would have liked instead. And you can get away with that, but the rest of us uh, need to do some kind of exploration and justify why we should invest a couple of million or more designing an aircraft to a certain specification to meet a requirement we've been given. And that's where the conceptual design comes in. So this is a, we've got here a historical metric A. This is about uh, fuel consumption. Uh, it doesn't matter for us, it's just a constant here. Uh, we've got, so if we want to have variable wing sweep in our design, uh, there's a penalty for that in terms of the weight fraction. Uh, there's different uh, constants available for different things uh, for variable sweep. There's an experiment for weight sensitivity uh, around technology. But so uh, we can, again, we can make a function for working up what the empty weight fraction is based on uh, those uh, parameters. So we've got our, our bomber historical metric, uh, it, it's just going to be 0.93. This would make a lot more sense if you if you read the book, but it's just what we're saying is we're putting in and we're creating a model of all the different uh, parameters and uh, relationships between parameters that we know about for our aircraft conceptual design. <coughs> so uh, we're working out that we should be aiming for an empty weight fraction of 0.436. Uh, and then we can work out what should our fuel fraction be. And we have uh, could work it relative for that based on the historical metrics. So our fuel fraction, and then we can work out what the cruise fuel burn would be. So we've got things like velocity, we've got specific fuel consumption, which we'll know for certain types of different engine. We can uh, estimate the lift to drag ratio based on historical uh, understandings. And that can give us our range uh, by relating those two, and it can be rearranged to give us a weight fraction. Uh, and then again, we're going to work out how much of, of the weight of the aircraft is going to uh, be dedicated to cruise, i.e. how much of that, that fuel is going to be burned off to cruise, uh, given uh, here the specific fuel consumption of a high bypass turbofan, which is what you see on things like um, the P8, the Poseidon, where they do a lot of cruise over uh, open water. Got our load to fuel burn, and uh, again, we're making a function for it. And at this point, you know, but Johnny, why are you making functions for all these things? Because if we make these things as functions, we can put them into a simulation and evaluate them very rapidly over lots of different parameters. Uh, so this is a class. So we're going to create a class here for an aircraft mission. And within it, we're going to evaluate all of these different things. So, so we can use this to represent lots of different types of mission and evaluate different aircraft concepts across all those missions at the same time. So. We're going to have a way to add segments. So we have segments like takeoff, like landing. Uh, we've got um, different methods here to calculate what the mission weight ratio for uh, an entire mission was. So once you've assembled it, lots of different segments, you can calculate for that mission what your mission weight ratio would have been. So with a given design of aircraft, how much fuel you would have burned, 
uh, whether you actually would have had enough fuel to do that mission, things like that. We can uh, create methods to calculate automatically for us the landing weight for a given mission, for a given aircraft design. And then also some convenience things for displaying uh, the mission, for listing it out. So we'll put all some of our answers in. We'll specify that mission we were talking about. So in Python, uh, when you want to create an instance of a class, um, you can see that I put ASW mission equals aircraft mission brackets. So I'm taking the aircraft mission class, which we've created, and I'm assigning it, and I'm, I'm saying I want ASW mission to be an instance of that class, and then I'm going to uh, use the methods created in the class to add some segments to it, like warm up and take off, climb, cruise, uh, all of those, I'm saying how much we, we should predict uh, the weight fraction will be. For the early weight fractions, we know it's going to be almost nothing of the previous weights could be consumed because um, we, we know that uh, uh, warm up and take off is not going to take a lot. Uh, climb is going to be reasonably understood because the bulk of it's all going to be consumed during cruise. And we've got those functions we created for working out what the cruise weight fraction and loiter weight fractions will be. And we can change the amount of uh, cruise, uh, the cruise speeds. We can change the, the cruise um, range, the, the loiter times, all of it is, is parameters we can alter to explore that solution space. So you can very quickly get to something where you're exploring concepts in a very fast and powerful way with a relatively small amount of code. You can laugh at me later. Um, and then we can uh, look, use the rest of the convenience functions we created for est estimating the fuel fraction, the empty weight fraction, and calculating uh, that uh, gross takeoff, that initial gross takeoff weight, uh, the difference uh, between uh, calculated and estimated gross takeoff weights, and uh, we'll make it aware of that. So you can see it's put it up and told us uh, what it is estimating the weight fractions to be for those different sections. And uh, it thinks the fuel fraction for that particular aircraft for that particular mission is going to have to be almost 40% of the aircraft weight is going to have to be fuel. Um, if we change some of those parameters, it will change uh, the results. And it's going to tell us for that mission, for that aircraft, we're going to burn something like 20,000 pounds of fuel. Okay, fine. Uh, but now we've got a function, we can interrogate it. Now, Raymer in his book, uh, he said, talks about the old way that you do, you'd iterate over it, manually evaluating it for lots of different combinations, uh, which is what we're doing here. So we're going to evaluate it for 50,000 different combinations um, of, uh, of different weights, because weight being the critical metric here, because uh, aircraft, as we mentioned, are sold by the pound. Uh, so we're calling in that map plot, plot plotting library, and we're going to make some subplots. It looks a bit complex because I'm going to have lots of axes. Uh, but all we're going to be doing is we're going to be plotting the calculated gross takeoff weights. And, and we're looking at the difference between uh, the calculated weight to what is we estimate would be the optimum. And see if we can find a value in there that's a sweet spot, uh, the minimum needed for that particular mission. So we'll just put that there. Come on, do with the hair presto. Okay, it decided it wanted to be over here. So you can see that the empty weight fraction um, is continuing to descend as our estimated uh, total gross weight uh, increases because the larger the aircraft is, as a percentage, the less fuel is actually going to be, be burned. But the larger the aircraft is, the more expensive it is. And um, you can see our calculated um, uh, gross takeoff weight uh, is very closely tracking that. And, but we're also looking at the difference between these very similar two curves, and that's showing us that we actually have an optimum uh, here for the, what the best possible takeoff gross weight for the aircraft, the design takeoff gross weight should be, of just around 56,700 pounds, uh, with an empty weight fraction of 0.43. So we're actually saying that we want an empty weight fraction of just over 43%. Okay, great. So that's a lot of manually typing in uh, and uh, iterating over our array uh, on one parameter to get that result. Is that something we want to be doing? Well, it's better than doing it by hand uh, or in Excel. Uh, but if we call in SciPy and import that library, there is a fleet of optimization uh, algorithms available. So we can import uh, SciPy, optimize, and in this case, we want to minimize because we want to minimize the empty weight of that aircraft. So we have the most affordable aircraft for that mission possible. And we don't have to optimize it on a single variable as we're doing here. This is actually something you could, you could use this algorithm 
and the algorithms within this library to optimize off uh, uh, multiple parameters at the same time. The more degrees of freedom you give any minimization or uh, maximization algorithm, the longer it's going to take because it will have lots of different uh, uh, combinations it has to explore. But it will, because we've defined it as a as a class and we've provided all those different uh, accessor methods as functions, it can actually do across the whole thing automatically because it can go and evaluate it, uh, which makes a very powerful result in that uh, you can get something that, uh, if you're iterating over it, you, the amount of time it took is significantly more than it did if you just pass it to a minimization algorithm. Uh, it just takes a lot less time and it has a lot more ability to handle multiple degrees of freedom when you're doing multiple domain optimization. And uh, if you get to some really interactive problems, you can then go to things like OpenMDA, um, which came out of NASA, which again is written in Python, but using things like NumPy, uh, to, to really uh, explore the solution space. So, um, yeah. So Sorry? Every time you press return, yep. are you changing a slide or actually running the program? I'm running the program. So it's done 50,000 loops in that, like, less than a second. Yeah. Okay. And this is this is an old uh, ThinkPad L540. Uh, so Python is not slow by any means. Um, it's not as fast as you can have, but so you can have some very fast Python, and especially when you're offloading it to NumPy, which is actually just C, it just pretends it's Python uh, for social occasions. Um, so we just quickly we can see that we have a very small difference between what we calculated using an iterative method to what we calculated using our, our minimization algorithm. We were handing off all the exploration to uh, an algorithm from the library, and so we get very good results there. Um, but we're not just here to talk about optimization. We want some aerodynamics, we're aerospace engineers, or at least I am. And so for me, one of the things that is always super cool, but which I don't have uh, time to do professionally, is aerodynamics. So there's a wonderful aero sandbox library I contributed to many years ago, uh, but uh, it's uh, almost entirely the work of a guy named Peter Sharp, who's a PhD, or was a PhD student in America. Um, and uh, for those of you who've uh, played with power methods, uh, he took uh, that and uh, Rorsitz Lassen methods for uh, estimating uh, coefficients for arbitrary uh, shapes. And uh, you can add arbitrary airfoils into it. This is one uh, that uh, I'm going to add in. Uh, you'll see why I won't, because there, is a, there was a very funny looking aircraft uh, called uh, the 1977 Wild Turkey by a guy named John Parker. The aircraft in this system. So you can see at the top, we've got airplane and an open bracket. That's because there's an airplane class in this library. So I've created an instance of the airplane class. And I'm telling you what I want this aircraft to be. So we've got a name, we've got a CG location, and then we've got some important bits to us, aerodynamics, uh, which is we've got some wings. So we can define some wings. We can say it's a symmetric section. Uh, we can say it where the leading edge is. We can tell it how many cross sections it has. What the cord is going to be, so with 1.2 uh, meters, because uh, this uh, wild turkey had a very fun looking wing. Um, how much twist, what airfoil to specify. Um, there's no control surface on this particular uh, wheel bit, because this is a buried wing. And then we can add additional ones, so we've got like a fillet tip. And again, we can specify the cord, the twist, where the leading edge is, um, ta any taper, things like that. Uh, we can add in control surfaces. Uh, so. We uh, say we've got a, uh, an asymmetric control surface, so it's an airborne, so one side will be going up, the other side will be going down. We can specify uh, different sections and airfoils for our tips and our cord again. Uh, and then we've uh, just specified the horizontal stabilizer here uh, with a different uh, airfoil section. And with that, in that one, it's, it's symmetric because it's for an elevator. And we can say where we want the hinge points to be, what the deflection to be uh, in the neutral position. So you can see we're, we're specifying an aircraft. So any guesses how funny that aircraft looks? So that, I think you will agree, is a funny looking aircraft. Why does scroll suddenly have to be disabled when I want it? Um, so you can see you have this very high chord section in the middle. Uh, which rapidly tapers to two uh, high aspect ratio sections uh, on the outside. But this was a real aircraft that existed and flew uh, called the Wild Turkey. And now, through the magic of Aero Sandbox, we can apply the vortex lattice method to it and calculate some characteristics for it. 
Uh, and what I'd want to do is, well, if you're designing an aircraft from scratch, you would want to have a rapid way of evaluating gross coefficients uh, so you can then evaluate them from a controls perspective uh, and evaluate them against, uh, okay, this design looks like it have a certain amount of lift. Is the aircraft going to weigh less than that? Fingers crossed. So we can quickly run, and you see it's already run and it's completed on that. Oh no, it needs to be instantiated. So there we go. It's, uh, it's created an error problem, and now it's just run the error problem. So we found out we'll get uh, our lift coefficients, um, the total amount of lift uh, for the given velocity, because we total is at 10 meters per second. We've got our drag calculated. You can see we have quite a lot of drag. Uh, we've got our coefficients of lift, drag, um, our, our moments, uh, pitching moments. You can see I specified the angle of attack uh, and any yaw angles. Um, so you can evaluate, and because this is all Python, you can specify uh, with those different parameters. You can pass it to SciPy, optimize, minimize, and find the best cruise condition for a given geometry, or you could arbitrarily change the geometry and find the best span for a given takeoff weight or a given uh, wing section. So these things connect together very well. And uh, that is one of the things that I've come to really love about Python, uh, is that there are so many things you can just connect together. And because they're all objects and they all communicate together very nicely, and because they're fast enough for practical purposes, you can get a lot of really nice stuff done. Uh, so we're going to look at a little bit of flight data now, because that is my main job. Uh, I'm a research fellow in flight data. So many of you have probably heard about the black box of an aircraft. It's the orange one at the back. So here we've got some data, not from black box, but from uh, ADSB, which is a, a transponder service where aircraft, uh, it's something called secondary radar. Um, and it's actually from one of Crown Falls aircraft. Um, so we can see we can quickly use the Pandas library, which we imported there, uh, to read the CSV file. And we're, we're printing uh, a list of the columns of that flight. So we can see we've got timestamp. Uh, we've got the UTC time, call sign, position, altitude, speed, direction, all wonderful stuff. Uh, this is, so this is the Pandas library. So Pandas was what happened when people were using NumPy and decided it wasn't friendly enough. So they added a bunch of additional methods to make it easier to interact with all that data. Uh, it's called Pandas because it's panel data. It's basically a lot closer to Excel. Uh, but uh, what we can do is for different columns in that. So for the speed column, uh, we'll get what's the minimum, what's the maximum speeds that were detected in that. And also, you can see I've got length, which is why the built-in method in Python, I want to know what is the total length of my data, how many rows are in this uh, uh, frame. So you'll see we've got 190 rows in this frame. Uh, the, minimum, minimum, the least speed is zero, and the maximum speed is 32. Fine. Um, but maybe I want to know how fast did the aircraft change the altitude? What's the greatest uh, differences between uh, one recording and the next in terms of altitude change? Uh, so you can apply the diff method uh, to get this diff column, and then we can get the maximum minimum change in altitude, so 145 uh, feet uh, between uh, recordings, uh, or 24 uh, feet. Um, but there's also specialist libraries. So uh, who here thinks time is a simple concept? It, it just goes in one direction, right? Wrong. It goes backwards. There's international specifications about how time goes backwards. Uh, not in reality, but in how computers record time. Uh, you often have uh, fractions of seconds that have to be taken off of a year to make it exactly the right length for the solar year. So you end up chopping and changing a little bit. We've got uh, days that disappear from months in leap, uh, outside of leap years. Uh, we've got leap seconds that have to be added at certain points. We've got uh, time zones where we will add an hour or take it away to do daylight savings. We do a lot of things uh, which we then tell, about, tell computers about that confuse the hell out of them. So we want a library to help us with that because when we get data in, uh, especially from unknown sources, um, and the maintainer might have uh, updated the clock on the aircraft, if it, if it says it's in Zulu time, we want to be sure we can handle that. If it's actually in uh, Central European time, we want to be able to convert it from one to the other because if we've got, we want to compare data from two different aircraft and one set in a different time zone, we've got to go right across one to the other. Python has a wonderful library for this called Daytime. Uh, so we'd, I'm just going to straight away convert that because I don't have time for anything else. So I'm telling it it's UTC time because that's what I was told. And I, I actually know for a fact it is. Um, and then we're going to do quickly do some 
some applications. So we, I could make a function to calculate these uh, nice little properties, the kinetic energy of the aircraft and the potential energy of the aircraft. Simple equations, all fine. But if I was looping over everything in that, uh, that database, okay, it's just 190 rows. It could be a lot more. I have to pass all the data in that column to my function and then pass back the answer. That could, if it's a lot of data, be a lot of stuff in memory. Pandas has this apply function where it will do all of that for you in C at very low level. This is called vectorization. We always refer to it as vectorization where we abstract away all of the complexity of looping over something and pass it to the lower level where it's done in C. So Python doesn't have to do it itself. That means you're not passing all of the mem all of the, that column to memory to be processed and then back again. It's all being handled at a much lower level. So it's much more memory efficient and it's much faster. Um, it doesn't matter for the 190 rows, but just give you a quick example of using an apply. Uh, access is because we want it to be done in a columnar fashion, not in a row-wise fashion. Uh, I'm also showing you a lambda, which is possibly uh, giving you two concepts at the same time. But a lambda is a function that only is used once, uh, just uh, for convenience. So we're just saying that uh, for each row R, we want the speed in that row. We want it times by the mass of the aircraft, which we have here. Uh, and uh, we want the speed also to be squared and also times by half. And similarly for the um, potential energy. So that calculates it all. And then we'll just do a quick plot of that. And you can see that the aircraft, uh, as you might expect, goes up, uh, cruises along, comes back down, and lands somewhere. We can see the speed. We've got uh, different cruise speeds that are set. And uh, if this wasn't uh, deciding that I need quite so much margin at the top, you'd see the bottom of that graph. Uh, longitude and latitude, Python I've found very helpful because uh, it seems that everyone in this dog has a different way of uh, specifying longitude and latitude as a position. Uh, leaving aside that there's different frames of reference, different coordinate frames, uh, WGS84 being one of the most popular because that's the, the GPS coordinate frame. Ordinate survey is different, you have to translate them. Much headache. Um, it's often the case that you'll get uh, a set of coordinates and you say, oh, it looks like latitude and longitude, but which one's the longitude and which one's the latitude? So you often have to reverse the order. That is what happens here because uh, I'm about to plot those on a map. And unfortunately for us, uh, it passes it longitude latitude, but I need it long latitude longitude. Uh, so this is what's called a uh, list comprehension. Uh, this is at the top where I'm just doing float for something. I'm doing a dot split. That's splitting the string because I actually got the coordinates as a string into two different sections. And then each of them is being converted into a float. And then I'm just uh, putting them into columns for latitude longitude. Um, then we've got uh, the GeoPans and Fronium library where we can put that into a special type of database that uh, is an extension of Pandas library, but it has special functions for handling geometries. It uses something called the Shapes library, and you can see we've got, we're specifying the coordinate reference system, which is, uh, that is the one that corresponds to the GPS system. And then we can plot it. And I am crippled again by uh, my lack of space, which I do apologize for, but uh, in the materials, you will be able to see it yourself. Uh, but um, here we go. Um, so this, what this was, was this the aircraft transiting. Uh, this was the, the old Jetstream National Flying Laboratory Center of Cranfield, uh, transiting uh, back from Glasgow, where it had been on exercise, uh, teaching some aerospace students up there how to do uh, flight uh, evaluation, and was coming back to Cranfield. And you can see the ADSB recording stops close to Cranville because uh, once the aircraft gets below a certain altitude, uh, radio uh, it, messages become a little bit less effective to the network that picks these up. And when they're trying to segment their data uh, into individual flights from analysis, they tend to cut off the very start and the very end just to be sure they don't get any taxing. Uh, but uh, there are other sources which can include that. It's just uh, how Flight Radar 24 does it. Uh, but to you, you can add all sorts of things into this. So I've done it as line screens where I wanted to interrogate what uh, different properties the aircraft were at different positions. We've done it for accident analysis. You can do a lot of this kind of thing in Python. And this is actually using JavaScript as well, but it's just glued together uh, to make it easier to, to work with. It's a, it's a leaflet.js map. Um, if we want to go further, we can use what's called QGIS, which is a geographic information system. And in this case, I was interacting with a container, which is, has anyone heard of Docker containers? 
they are very useful way to do reproducible reproducible computing, but they've uh, they came out of the computing industry where they replaced sort of based virtual machines uh, because it means you can have lots of different processes all running on a single server without having to worry too much about interconnection about setting up. You can just specify the environments required within a Docker container and then just set that running. And here I've got a PostgreSQL database in that container with all of my flight data, and you can see I've plotted it here on the map. Um, and then through the power of Python, we can take what's called a digital elevation model, which gives us the, the heights of everything above sea level for this rocky mountainous terrain over the south of France, which I mean, everyone would like to go to the south of France a lot more often. Uh, but this aircraft uh, decided upon leaving the south of France that they actually wanted to go back. Uh, they had a, um, uh, they squawked uh, 7700 for an emergency just as they got out over the, sea, uh, over the Mediterranean and came back. But because we've got the digital elevation method model and a little bit of Python and a little bit of SQL, we can work out the exact height above terrain of the aircraft throughout its flight because we know the altitude and we know the actual uh, terrain heights. We can calculate height above terrain, um, which is very useful. So this aircraft landed safely, which is why I'm showing it to you. Uh, but there's so much you can actually do to glue together these different sources of information. So here we have digital elevation models, uh, which is a geotiff. We have SQL, which is a, a very popular type of database. We have uh, flight physics, and we're gluing it all together using Python to tell us useful things about what happened to the aircraft and where it was going during the flight. Um, one last bit, Robert, which I, I thought was absolutely fantastic, is because as an engineer, I have a, an intense rivalry with pilots who get to play with the pretty aircraft. Um, uh, so, one of the things that uh, we uh, were doing uh, a number of years ago is we wanted to know whether pilots would actually notice if there was a problem with the engine. So we've got some real engine data where the engine had had a problem, and I stitched it together with a simulation. So this was a, an A320, and you can see uh, we mocked up the, the, the engine panels uh, using a bit of JavaScript. And Py because Python is so flexible, you can connect in uh, using web sockets between this web page, which had uh, the, the simulated panels. There was also a big panel showing the, the simulated cockpit, uh, which is kind of hidden behind there, uh, but we could control the back end of the flight simulation, which in this case was flight gear, very good open source free flight simulator, but could just have easily been x which has exactly the same interface over Telnet to control the internal properties of the flight simulator. And we could pipe in the real mishap information to the engine and make the aircraft do the same things the mishap aircraft did and see if the uh, very skilled pilots could notice the oncoming precursors where the engine was starting to grumble a little bit before the event actually happened. Um, that research is still ongoing. They just shows one of the things you can do where you can hook together flight simulators and real data from uh, CSV or otherwise and just pipe it in and override simulation quantities and also take uh, what the pilot is doing in response to that and uh, just slurp it back out to do some analysis on it. Um, it is very powerful what you can do. And Helping parts to understand what they've done and seeing what they can do is one of the most critical things in terms of connecting all of that back together for flight safety. Because for the near future, we're still going to have pilots flying aircraft. So being able to work out how to design the right aircraft for, for some requirement, how to connect it into data about how aircraft are actually used, how to uh, connect in uh, the aircraft environment, where we want mapping data about things like how close they were to the taxiway, how fast for, for, for far they were from going off the runway, and then also connecting into how air pilots actually fly the aircraft and how they could fly the aircraft. Really gives us a comprehensive way of, of attacking flight safety from all angles using uh, Python, which I think is pretty, pretty cool. So containerization, uh, I mentioned, uh, there's uh, two examples uh, which um, I've, I've made available. One of them is the aircraft sizing example with a lot more explanation. And the other one is the flight data example, uh, which is that same data of the transit. And uh, they're both made available uh, via the magic of Docker and Kubernetes uh, in what's called the binder service. So um, I will publish them as links, and you'll be able to click on, on those links, and it will launch uh, in a server far away that just a Jupyter notebook that you can interact with. So you won't need to install anything, but you can have a go with that code and explore it. And that, I think, is a very powerful thing which has been made possible by Jupyter Notebooks and also by this containerization uh, phenomenon that's swept the IT industry. Um, and when we want to communicate something in code, 
showing your, your pretty maths to explain what the underlying physics are, and then showing how you've calculated uh, what it really means on your data. I think that is a very powerful way of communicating. Engineering is actually, I think, mostly about communication. So I hope this has been uh, very useful to you. Um, next month, uh, if you bring your laptop back to the cafe, we can dive in and uh, do some practical uh, stuff together. Uh, but so uh, thank you very much. I'm going to unmute Zoom now so I can hear the howls of uh, annoyance at uh, how long I've been. Right, you're, you're, you're not muted anymore. Can you, can you hear me, Zoom? Ah, Dan is saying they're using Docker as well. I'll stop my video back up. How are you all? Are you still with us? There you go. I think everyone is now on themselves. So, um, does anyone have any questions? Um, are there any um, are good there... online examples uh, that would be like a working examples that we could work through? Uh, yes, uh, those were the, the bindings. I, I can put them in, in Zoom right now, actually. Um, I'll just uh, copy that link. So this is the FDM example. So um, I'm still screen sharing. So if I click on that, uh, you can see it will... Yes, I'm OK. Actually, no, I don't want to leave Zoom. Because then I will lose you all. Um, so if I go back to the Jupyter notebook I was sharing and I put that in, um, you can see it goes to the Binance service, which is uh, hosted by Google Cloud, GS Notebooks and Turing. Definitely look at Turing Suit if you want to know more about uh, data and software in the UK from a research or engineering perspective. They've got a lot of uh, great research going on. But it's, uh, it's got the notebook and it's got all the requirements uh, that that notebook needs in order to run. And it loads it up um, and then you can just run through it. It's got the data, you can see it's got all the stuff I was doing just now, but instead of running on my local laptop, it's running on the server somewhere. You don't need to pay for the server. There are certain practical limits about how big, how much data you could put into it or how much compute you could use. But the binding service is excellent for just having a little, a little play with programming. So I will, uh, I will make sure that that, uh, that link and the other link uh, for the uh, for the design uh, example is included. If I go, if I leave that page and just uh, go and get the other link, I, I can quickly share that one as well. Um, but yeah, uh, are there, while I get that other link, are there any other questions? I think there was a question regarding uh, when the recording will be made available. So um, the webcast is recorded, we need a little bit more post processing. Uh, to get that. As long as that's safe. Johnny, do you have anywhere you would prefer to host the video? Um, I don't mind. Um, I've put stuff on YouTube before. Um, I, I don't have a preference. I, I can host it or whatever, yeah. Okay, yeah, no, what, I, what I'll do is I'll, I'll get that video uh, put together, edited, and then um, can share the wherever, wherever it ends up going on LinkedIn uh, and Twitter and all the, you know, all the, all the places that the event was promoted and so everyone can, can, can grab it when they need. Yeah, that'd be great. Um, and so here, this is that other one uh, example I was talking about, which is the conceptual aircraft design. You can see this is the, the Jupyter notebook, and it's got a lot more uh, text just explaining what all these things are, uh, what fuel fraction really means, uh, more about uh, the cruise uh, cure burn, lift drag ratio estimation, all of that. Uh, so you can just have a play. Okay. Fantastic. So no, we, have, we have a question here. Uh, if you go back to the flight data from the NFL, and we plotted the, the geodetic coordinates in the map. Yep. There are some drop-offs, data drop-offs. Yeah. Is, is Python... No, that, that, that's not a Python problem. That's a, that's a data problem. So that data is ADS B data, and it was from Flight Radar 24. So Flight Radar 24 is a number of um, hobbyist uh, radios receiving data, passing it uh, using. Uh, 
is uh, 1090 something is the name of the program is, and they're uploading it to Flight Radio 24 service. So where there is not enough coverage, data will be missed. Um, I think you're talking about uh, this one. I, I just need to make this trusted so it'll uh, appear. I have to scroll down again. <clears throat> so, uh, so yeah, because it's, uh, it's yeah, this one. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's just to do with uh, how the radio messages are received from the aircraft. If you if you've got no line of sight between a radio and the aircraft, it won't receive it. Uh, the frequency it, it uh, is that is a VHF band, and it doesn't have much in the way of bouncy or skip behaviours. So if you're not in the line of sight of the aircraft, you're not going to be able to receive it. And things like trees and other things will reduce the strength of the signal as well. So that that is not a Python uh, missing some rows. It's there, there was only 190 samples in that particular flight, uh, just because of how the data was there. Well, probably for the data set from the NFL. No, uh, so this was downloaded from Flight Weather 24, where I have an account. Uh, I do have NFLC data, but I can't make that public. Um, the, the, if you're uh, within Crownfield and you want to work with NFLC data, come see me. I, I have some. Uh, I can introduce you to NFLC where they also have more. Uh, within my centre, uh, thanks to uh, Dr. David Barry and Professor Bray, Bray, Graham Braithwaite, we have something like 16 terabytes of data from commercial airliners, which we work with, looking at uh, analyzing. Uh, I'm doing a project at the moment on precision touchdown, working out exactly where on a runway the aircraft touches down, which you might think we know. But apart from which runway, we don't actually have very good information because the latitude longitude uh, location is not stored at any great accuracy because it wasn't required previously. Um, generally, you know where the aircraft landed in an accident because you, you, you find it. Um, you don't need to know to, to the, the nearest half meter or, or better. This is what we're looking at because we want to look at exactly uh, where the aircraft touched down and how uh, what, what the factors were to a run, what's called a runway excuse, where you depart the runway either left or right before you get to a taxiway. So there's a, we do have a lot of data. If you're either within Cranville or you want to work with it, just come and say hello. Does that answer your questions? Yes, thank you. It's, it's the difference between external data versus internal flight data recorder data. Right. Yep. How much, sorry, how much is Python used within industry, like, forming? And because uh, uh, I suppose well known as Python, but I mean, all those toolboxes, uh, I presume they're, free, they're sort of open source. Uh, all the stuff I've shown you is free and open source. Um, Does it validate and verify or something? Because we're using sort of formalized like, designs and stuff, and you do kind of. Sure, what you're doing. Um, yeah, well, the, it's, of, it's different things for different jobs. Because if you do conceptual design, or if you're trying to explore lots of different options, and oh, write yeah, that, yeah. Python, if you're doing uh, a, 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 a flight safety critical device that's going to be on all the time and it has to have like nine nines of reliability, I mean, these these days you probably wouldn't look at C, you, you might consider us, but it probably is still going to be C or ADA or one or the other. Languages which has a an, an ASME approved compiler, uh, and you'll be doing a lot of um, doors driven development and things like that. Like Agile will not be your friend. Uh, <laughs> you'll spend a lot of time looking at corner cases where there's buffer overflows and things like that. That would be what you would do. Uh, Python is not necessarily the choice for that. Although there is some Python libraries that will compile to see for putting on an embedded device. Um, I'm not sure it's still that it would be suitable for a flight safety critical application. But the, not to say it's not useful. It, there's so many different things where uh, C is not the right choice or R is not the right choice. And equally, it's things where Python is not the right choice. But for quickly connecting stuff together and, and evaluating, I think Python's ideal. Any other questions here? Uh, is there any other questions from Zoom? was a quick question regarding finding the uh, weight link. The weight link. Um, oh, that's the, um, I can post that here, but I'll also post it in the, the LinkedIn. This is, this is the aircraft sizing example. Um, all of those are both on GitHub. So any 
uh, do come up on GitHub if you've included a, a, what's called a requir requirements.txt or, or an environment.yaml file with it, you could use it with Binder and launch it in the service, which is what I've done here. Both of these are GitHub repositories that I've configured correctly so that Binder can recognize what libraries are required and launch them. So I've put that in the chat now. Uh, the uh, links and events page as well. Um, uh, there's, um, yeah, so Dan, you're praising about uh, Flight 24 or Python Receiver. There's also a very, another good service if you're interested in ADSB data, which is the Open Sky Network. They're much more research orientated. Uh, and they have, in my opinion, um, I, I use both, but I think Open Sky Network is much better, if you, especially if you want to get a lot of data for research, because they have an, an API that is uh, free for researchers. You just send them an email, explain what you want to do, and as long as you meet certain requirements, uh, which are very straightforward, they they happily happily give you access, and that's much more useful if you want to do bulk analytics. That's where the uh, in-flight emergency data came from. They have a set uh, which um, they published about that, which uh, I can I can send the link to people if they want that. Yeah. Yep. What did you put in your Docker setup? I mean. Um... Because you don't put any uh, library directly, you just send configuration and yeah. overload it. So the server has everything. Uh, yeah. Are, are you talking about the, the binder application or Docker in general? Uh, no, the, you, so you have your, basically your programming uh, Python. Yep. And uh, you upload it on the Docker, but you also upload the environment at some point. Yeah, so what, what, what I have in Docker is I've got two types of things I, I use Docker for at the moment. One is for hosting databases, uh, because it means I don't have to configure my, my own PC. I can just configure the Docker container, uh, really with a flavor of Linux, making sure it's got the right dependencies for that database. So uh, I use PostgreSQL. Uh, I use uh, the timescale DB and PostGIS extensions. So that's actually very straightforward to specify in Docker. Uh, it's literally like four or five lines. There's much more time spent doing like security and networking than there is specifying what uh, what database or Python libraries I might need. Uh, one thing with Docker is a lot of people use Alpine Linux for Docker, but that uses Musil C, not uh, ANSI or NuC. Uh, so it, sometimes there are different interactions because Python assumes a, a specific type of C compiler is present in this environment. So if it's not, it can lead to some odd behavior. But apart from that, it's it's been very straightforward. And the other thing I use it for is uh, flight simulation. So I'll have flight simulator instances in the Docker container pre-configured. So I'll launch the Docker container, it will spin up, and then it will start the flight simulation and do everything in that. And then when it's finished, it will just send me the data back. And it's just keeping things more isolated from my working environment, where I'll have a lot of different libraries and I'm constantly changing things. Does that answer your question? Okay, but there's some very, if people want to know more about putting a Python algorithm in a Docker container to do a specific job, uh, happy to answer emails about that and discuss. Uh, any more from Zoom? Okay, um, well, uh, I'd like to say thank you all very much for coming. I hope you've enjoyed your time uh, at the Flaming National Cafe, either in person or virtually. Um, and uh, yeah, we'll have another, we'll have a, there's going to be a have a more of a practical session on programming the Python next month. If you're interested in that, do uh, watch out for details that will be popping up. And then in December, we have a talk by Andrew Barber from the uh, Hybrid Air Vehicles Group, who will be talking about uh, airfield operations at Carlington from shed to sky, which uh, I know they'll be uh, all interested in that. Uh, but uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Thank you. I was starting for hosting Zoom. Thank you. Thanks to your wife for hosting us. Yeah, yes. Bye, guys.